started this morning and uh, get our try to get through as much of the study as we can and uh, see how it goes. So let's open with a word of prayer and then uh, we'll get started. I believe we're recording these uh, to put on the internet here for those who miss or for those who uh, are working in another area. So uh, those should be available later on in the week here. So let's pray and let's uh, jump in this morning. Father, we do thank you for your word. We thank you that it is quick and powerful and that it illuminates even the darkest of hearts and even the most holy of hearts, whether it was Paul or whether it was some lost soul in the Bible, Lord, your word was able to speak to it and change it and conform it to your image. And Father, I pray this morning as we open your word and we study this adversary, as he's called in scripture, the devil, I pray, Father, that as we study this, that we find out what the truth is concerning this angelic being that was created um, for your glory. And Lord, how you allowed free will to be there and, and that his rebellion did affect a lot of other things in creation today. And Lord, I pray that as we study this out, that we'll see that uh, you control all, that you are sovereign over all, and that, Father, nothing happens that you didn't ordain it to happen. And Lord, even this uh, enemy of the cause of Christ is still subject to you through sovereignty. So, Father, help us see that. In your name we pray this morning. Amen. Amen. All right, last week, by review, we uh, talked about your adversary, the devil. We noted the first thing that you must do is you must know your enemy. We talked about Israel with the Six-Day War and how in the Six-Day War they were outnumbered virtually 10 to 1. And uh, by doing due diligence, infiltrating the enemy, knowing the enemy, knowing where the generals were, knowing where the airplanes were, knowing where the ground troops were, and uh, knowing how to use their equipment the best way they could, they were able to not just win the war, but they emphatically destroyed 90% of Egypt's military capability and the, then the Jordanians, then the Syrians, by virtue of them being surrounded and then taking out the different enemies of Israel, they were able to live at peace with their enemies for many years following this crisis, this, this event for Israel. Israel, you remember before the attack, was pretty small and had a lot of pieces wedged and hacked out of it. After the war, though, they controlled all the way to the Nile River, all the way north to Damascus, and all the way east, almost, to the capital city of Jordan. So when we read about Israel in the New Testament, in Revelation, expanding our borders to Damascus, to the Sinai Peninsula, and to west or east into Jordan uh, in the Tribulation period, we know that she has had these borders before, even in some of the lifetimes of people that you might know. So we talked about knowing the enemy, and we talked about the importance of knowing the enemy, and the problem we have today in the church is this. Many Christians do not take the enemy serious enough today. Um, many don't take him serious. Many think that, you know, Satan is just this, this foe, this adversary of God. And because I'm a Christian that I'm untouchable and Satan can't do anything to me. Is that true? Who is the only person Satan can't touch? God himself. If you remember, and we were to go to Job chapter 2, or Job chapter 1 this morning, verse, um, basically the first chapter there, the whole first chapter, we have a conversation between Lucifer and God, don't we? And who is it that initiates the conversation about Job? Satan or God? God does. So why was Job attacked? Because God wanted him to be. Let me ask you a question. Why are you attacked? Because God allows it to happen. And uh, he is faithful, and he is sovereign, and he is just, and he is holy, and he is faithful. And all the attributes of God apply to your situations to where God will see you through whatever the trial is that you may be facing. Israel was facing a seemingly impossible scenario. However, what was their odds of winning? 100%. God was in it, and God had their back and protected them. Which leads really to the third point that we started out talking about in preview, and that is this. Satan's main strategy is to make us think that he doesn't exist. Uh, do you know that of interviewed Christians, 
up to 25% of Christians believe that the devil is just an allegory. They don't believe in a literal person named Satan. They don't believe in something created named Satan. Now, this is professing Christians. This isn't worldly people. Do you realize that most Christians today think that the devil is red with pointed tails and a pointed ears and he holds a pitchfork? Most Christians, when interviewed, did not describe Satan as an angel of light. They described him as a dark creature, an evil creature, and somebody that has flaming fire coming off of him. Are any of those descriptions true today? Not of Satan. What does Satan look like today? He's an angel of light still, isn't he? He still has the ability to walk into the throne room of God and accuse the saints, doesn't he? Yeah. Yeah, he's the same guy. He has not yet been thrown down. He has not yet been cast down. He has not yet been eternally punished. And uh, he is still a very much an angel created by God. And uh, he leads a crew of angels. And we'll look at all these things here uh, in the next several weeks as we dig into the scripture. So, um, not as beautiful as him, because he was singled out as the, one of the most beautiful. But they are going to be angels of light, not angels of darkness. Because that's how they were created. So, which is an interesting thing, because what is hell? Hell is eternal darkness right and here are these angels that supposedly have light but they succumb to darkness and their lights go out um and the bible has something to say about even kids songs sing about that right this little right so there's even teaching about that in the bible make sure that your light doesn't what go out it's not extinguished or it's not hindered by the things that you do. Well, the angels represent that. The light? No. It's the reflection of the Shekinah glory of God off of the created beings. Is really what it is. So remember when uh, the presence of God filled the temple, what, what filled the temple? The Shekinah glory of God. So, um, then we talked about number four. He hides all over the earth. That the whole world is his place. And this is kind of where we ended last week. So this is where I'm going to pick up. We did talk about some of the stats and things. I'll review that in a second. But uh, somebody read for, well, you don't have to read it. I'll put it on the screen. Job 2.2. 2. And the Lord said to Satan, from where have you come? And Satan answered the Lord and said what? From going where? To and fro on the earth and walking up and down on it. What direction does Satan travel? Every direction. The world is his kingdom, if you will. This is his area of being. Ephesians 6.12 says this, We don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and against authorities and cosmic powers over the present darkness and against the spiritual forces of evil in the where? Heavenly forces that are not in heaven. Who are they? The angels. These are the fallen angels. So the Bible flat tells us that we're wrestling today not against flesh and blood. And as, as human beings, we like to wrestle against flesh and blood. We like to identify an enemy. How many of you realize Joe Biden's not an enemy of the Christian? Can Joe Biden get saved? Could he respond to the gospel? Will he? That's up to God. That's up to God. Ephesians 1 tells us what? They're... The people who are saved were chosen before the foundation of the world. Well, let me ask you a question. How much influence do we have in that? So, you know, regardless of what he does while he's alive, if God wants to save Joe Biden, he can do that. Could Joe Biden be saved today? He could be. Is he living like it? Not by some of the choices he makes. Murder is not acceptable in the sight of God's eyes. Um, and we could go on and on. And my job is not to pick on him. I could substitute Donald Trump there. I could substitute Ronald Reagan there. I could substitute George Washington. I could substitute Saddam Hussein. I could substitute Hitler. Um, we could go throughout history and you could take individuals. How about Herod? How about Nero? How about 
You and I, exactly. Exactly. What about us? And uh, so we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against really the cosmic powers over this present darkness. So we're in a battle and there's somebody against us. And we need to realize that as Christians, we're in a battle. We're in a war. We're not walking around in the Garden of Eden today. We're in a war. We're in a fallen area. We're in a battle zone. If you were to go over to Afghanistan today, things are kind of going the wrong way over there right now, aren't they? Not hearing a lot about it in the news, but the terrorists are taking the country over again, and and we're seeing the rise of terrorism over there again. And and if you were over there in Afghanistan, would you just walk around like you're in New York City? No. You're going to be watching out for the enemy. You're going to be cautiously traveling. You're going to plan your travel. You're going to understand the enemy and where they're moving and what's going on. And how many Christians are living like that today? We don't. We just go through life thinking, hey, God's got this. I can do whatever. And we don't know our enemy. We don't understand what he's like. Not only are we in a battle against somebody, but it is a battle literally for life and death. It is a life and death fight against Satan. There are people dying going to hell. Why? Because Satan has deceived them. They bought into the lies of the world. And we who are alive, those that have everlasting life, it should bother us that people are dying and going to hell. When you see statistics like we're going to look at in a second where, you know, only 4% of the world's population is evangelical Christian today. When only 25% of Americans today actually profess to be Christians. When only 9% of professing Christians actually attend a church on a weekly basis. That means this, as you go throughout your day, out of every 10 people you run into, one of them goes to church. One of them actually believes Jesus died on the cross for their sin, he rose again in the third day, and that they have the ability to go to heaven by virtue of what Jesus Christ has done for them. If you want to take the most liberal of statistics, 2.5 people you run into on a daily basis are on their way to heaven. Now, do we, have an actual, do we have a field that's white into harvest, or do we have a harvest that's so picked over that there's nothing left? So the Bible is telling us, Christians, that the fields are white to harvest. The problem is the laborers are... Why? Because they bought the lie. They've bought into the lie that uh, because I'm okay, everything is... But God never has instructed Christians to live for themselves. Somebody give me a verse that God says you can live for yourself and not care about others. Give me the verse. Then why do we live like it? As long as I got the gospel, as long as I'm going to heaven, as long as I'm good, as long as... And this is the problem we're running into in the modern day church. This is why the church today is insignificant. Because if you bring nothing but eternal damnation, well, that's what the world brings. So what's the point? If I'm going to go to church and be judged, well, the world does that for me. What's the point? If I'm going to go and just find out that I'm okay, you're okay, what's the point? And we're seeing the the exodus from it. But listen to what Ephesians 6.10 says. It says this. Finally, Be strong in the what? Be strong in who? Be strong in... How strong are you in the Lord this morning? How much are you depending on the power of His might? The strength of His hand in your life? Versus trying to do it on your own. And this is really where we stopped last week in in talking about this topic so if we're going to know the enemy then we better know the characteristics of the enemy and one of the things that we need to understand about our enemy is this the lord and his people are in a battle against the devil and his angels okay we wrestle not against what flesh and so what are we fighting the devil and the angels That's a good question. That's what we're going to study. That's the whole point. If the devil is our adversary, how much is he going to help you? How much is he going to support you? 
How much is He going to encourage you? How much is He going to assist in the mission that you were called to do? He's not. Matter of fact, He's going to work against you and He's going to work against you to a degree that He wants to ensure that He wins. Okay? So listen to a couple of verses out of Ephesians here. Ephesians 6.11 says this, Put on the whole armor of God that you might be able to what? Isn't it interesting the word stand is used there? Why not run? Why not fight? Why not push? The battle's not ours. God's doing the fighting. The only thing we got to do is stand the fiery darts of Satan. We got to hold the ground. But who's going to advance the kingdom? This is the whole story of Jericho, isn't it? In Jericho, what were they told to do? Go to the building, walk around it, go home. Next day, come out of your building, walk around it, go home. By the way, put the priests up front and your old people up front. Put the warriors in the back. Let's see how it works out. That sounds like a good battle strategy, right? I mean, this is a winning ticket. The whole thing was do you trust the sovereignty of God? Do you trust the sovereignty of God? Do you trust that God's in control, Israel? If so, then do exactly what I say. Today, Christian, do you trust the sovereignty of God? Oh, but the government, oh, but this, oh, but the, oh, but, oh, but. Do you trust the sovereignty of God? The same question asked of Jericho, or the, the Israelites at Jericho, the same question asked of Gideon going against the Midianites, the same question asked about David going against the Philistines, the same question asked to every disciple is, do you trust me enough in the sovereignty to follow me? And every disciple that Jesus called, what did they say? Yes. Jesus said what? Follow me and I'll make you... And the ultimate question every Christian has to come to or has to deal with and come to an answer of is this. What are you going to do with the sovereignty of God? Are you going to have faith and live by it? Or are you going to have fear and live after the things of the world trying to control it? And when the Christian puts on the armor of God, we are able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Now, to stand means to hold your ground. We'll be able to hold the ground, but if we're going to advance, how do you do that? How's that going to happen? If Christianity is going forward, how's that going to happen? Well, I like what the next verse says, verse 16, as we jump down. In all circumstances, take up the shield of what? With which you can what? Extinguish what? The fiery darts of the evil one. Now, if you're throwing arrows at somebody, how close are you? <laughs> An arrow is a weapon of distance, isn't it? When Satan attacks, he's not going to go hand-to-hand -hand combat. He's going to lob in a fiery dart. What does a fiery dart do? Why use a fiery dart? Because it'll hurt? That's assuming it hits the target. If it misses, it's still going to cause damage, right? It's still going to cause grief. It's still going to cause something to happen to force people to react to it. And if you're in a dry field as an army and the enemy starts shooting fiery darts, what's the greatest fear? The fire, not the darts, right? The darts are bad if I'm in line with the dart. But the fire is going to affect what? Everybody. And Satan attack is not just an isolated sniper attack like we've been taught in Sunday school and all this stuff, the attack is very, pretty pervasive. If I can't hit you specifically, I'm going to hit you generally. Well, what happened when he hit Adam and Eve? He got them specifically, but what did he do to mankind generally? For one man, sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so sin passed upon all men, for all have... Was that the fiery dart, or was that the fire? That's the fire by virtue of the, the flaming darts that go out. So we fight an enemy of our soul. He's called in verse 11, if I back up, he's called what? The devil. In verse 16, he's called the evil one. So let's talk about Satan's personality when it comes to Scripture. So I need your help this morning to look up Scripture, and we only have a couple minutes left here, so we gotta, we got to move through this. But somebody look up Zechariah chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. Who wants that this morning? 
Zechariah 3, 1 through 5. All right, Kathy. Somebody else grab 1 Peter 5, 8. Who wants that one? Aaron? Somebody look up Revelation 12, 10. Karen? And somebody else, 2 Corinthians 11, 14, and 15. 2 Corinthians 11, 14, and 15. All right. Let's go with it here. So let's see what he's called in Zechariah 3, 1 through 5, and 1 Peter 5 and verse 8. Yep. So what is Satan doing in this picture? Where is he? He's standing in the throne room of God. And what's he doing? He's making accusations against a saint. What saint specifically? Joshua the high priest. Pretty good guy to make an accusation against. You take the priest down, what do you get? You're going to get all the followers. Right? Right? So here Satan is doing a directed attack, specifically at a person, and he accuses him of being filled with filthy rags. And what is the verdict? He's clothed with filthy rags. So what does Jesus do as the defense attorney? He takes off his clothes and gives him new clothes to wear and says, now what's your accusation, Satan? And what was the accusation? Doesn't have one. It's settled. And uh, so if you want to picture Zechariah 3, it's a courtroom. God the Father is sitting on the throne, and the defense attorney is Satan, or Jesus, and the prosecuting attorney is Satan himself, and on the stand is Joshua the high priest, and by every realm of man's ability, Joshua is guilty as charged by Lucifer, by Satan himself. However, what happens when the defense argues their case? It's covered. I've taken care of it. His clothes are changed. He's no longer dirty. He's clean. So what's your accusation now? And what, what's the defense say? We rest. If you read down further through the passage there, you'll find out that there's a branch that was grafted in. Jesus Christ himself takes the place uh, of the Savior. He grafts in the Gentiles and the Jews, and they're all able to come to the knowledge of salvation. And you see it underneath the root of David, and you see the branch that's grafted in underneath there in the rest of the passage. 1 Peter 5.8. Let's listen to it concisely now. So I gave you the Old, Old Testament story. Here's the New Testament truth. 1 Peter Absolutely. Same. Yep. Yep. First Peter five eight. Listen to what it says now. Be sober. Be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Lions are friendly, right? They're cute. They're cuddly. Go to the safari. Hang out with a couple lions, right? No. What do lions do? Especially roaring lions. What is the point of a roaring lion? Fear, right? When a lion roars, by the way, what lion roars, male or female? Male. The male does, right? Where's the female when that's happening? <laughs> that's the one doing the attacking. It's a distraction tactic. So what does Satan want to do? He wants to accuse you and he wants to distract you and put fear in you. How good is he at that? You ever been distracted by Satan? You ever had fear put in your life by Satan? Have you ever been so overwhelmed with the scenario that you're in that you lose your focus on Christ, the one that can help, and you solely focus on your problems instead of the solutions? You ever been there? 
then you have been against the adversary or you understand the attack of the adversary now. So you're getting a little bit of what he looks like. Listen to what else he does. He's also an accuser of the brethren. In Zechariah 3, 1 through 5, who's being attacked, Christian or unbeliever? A believer. Joshua the high priest. This is a believer who has fellowship with God. This is somebody who goes into the Holy of Holies and presents himself and his nation on an annual basis for the redemption of sin, for the forgiveness of sin. Listen to what Revelation 12 and verse 10 says. When is Satan kicked out of heaven? Future or present? It's future. So what does Satan have access to still today? So Zechariah 3 is happening right now in our current time period. This is why we've got to understand what's going on in heaven as much as we need to understand what's going on on earth because there is a heavenly battle that's going on for the souls of men. And before Jesus Christ, on, or before God the Father, on a daily basis, the saints are being accused before God. So let me ask you a question. If Satan's busy in heaven, who is it that's actually tempting you? Can Satan be omnipresent? Can Satan be all-powerful? Yeah. So we, Christians can't say, well, the devil made me do it. Really? Is that even possible? Is that even possible for a Christian to be forced to do something by the devil? Because if so, the tribulation saints are going to be in trouble. Because when they're told to take the mark of the beast, well, the devil made me do it. No, we, we choose. Listen to 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen and 15. Check this out. Jerry, read 15. Go for it. Loaded passage here, all right? We're going to revisit this one about six different ways. Uh, if you've ever watched the Blue Angels fly a aerobatic demonstration, there's a maneuver in which all six of them go up together and then they all starburst out. And then they all come back down and they cross the center of the airfield from different directions. All right. They, these verses here, we're going to cross literally from six different directions. Okay. As we deal with it. Because there's a lot here. Satan transforms himself into what? An angel of light. His followers are able to transform themselves into what? Apostles and angels of light. False teachers have the ability to transform themselves into what? Bearers of light, when they're really what? They're not. Understand our enemy. Because he's marred. Where do angels get their light from? It's a facade. It's a, it's a fake... He no longer reflects the Shekinah glory of God, because he can't. Remember, as Christians, what are we called to do? Whether therefore you eat or drink or whatever you do, do to the glory of God, okay? Everything God created reflects his glory. 
Well, he was created as one. Well, he still is, but he doesn't have the power as an angel of light. Yeah. He, he was created an angel of light. Did that change? No. What's changed is his ability to reflect that light. And by the way, this is a, this is a state of every believer and non-believer, isn't it? How Do unbelievers have the ability to reflect the glory of God? What has light with darkness? For light always dispels what? You can't get light out of darkness. You can only, in, you can only inject light into darkness. Hold that, th- right? Yep. Hold that thought because we're going to read another verse that says he was a liar from the beginning. That's that's going to be a tough one to figure out. Because if he was a liar from the beginning, a deceiver from the beginning, when's the beginning? Creation. So free will was injected into the angels at creation, and from the beginning of creation, somewhere between it is good. <laughs> all good, it is very good, to Satan's fall, that seed of lie, that seed of deceit, was already planted in his his being. One thing that makes it good is is that verse where it goes like, the the Jews were optimist to know Jesus was the Savior, so the Gentiles could receive the Savior. So there's a reason for this, this bad to come into the world, Yeah, cause and effect, right? So, so there is yeah. a reason for this. It's not like God is being out there saying, oh, I'm going to create bad. Well, the Bible says he's not the author of evil. He's not the creator of evil. So, so we got we to gotta wrestle through that. And he, evil is, like you said, it's good because right. it brings us to Jesus. When we have bad times, yep. we're in So we know he's an adversary. We know he's the accuser of the brother. We know he's an angel of light. And I know we're out of time. So we'll have to come back next week. And look at this in, in further. And by the way, we covered A, B, C of uh, all the way down through letter O. So, and that's just talking about his personality. So let's close in prayer. Next week, we'll get into more of these characteristics of Satan. And by the way, there are seven different uh, main titles we're going to cover. We're in title one, okay? The, the names are the personality of Satan. We're going to look at the role of Satan. We're going to look at Satan's goals. We're going to look at how uh, he has his own cheap imitations. Okay, I, I mentioned we're going to come back by that verse a bunch of time. How many cheap imitations that Satan has that are off plays of who God really is and who Jesus Christ really is. So uh, we're going to be in this for a while, so buckle up. And uh, we can't cover it all at the beginning because you want to be able to digest it. But I'm going to try to walk you through this and build up the topic. So by the time you're done, there is no excuse for why we give Satan attributes and credit for things he has no credit for and no attributes to do. So let's pray. Father, thank you for this time to study. I pray now as we transition to the morning worship service, Lord, that we see you high and lifted up. And as Christians, Father, who are called by your name, that we would humble ourselves and that we would focus our attention on you this morning for the great things that you have done for us. And Father, I pray that we as Christians would be thoroughly thoroughly convinced on the things that we believe to the point that we live by faith and we trust the sovereignty of God and we live like we trust the sovereignty of God. We live up to the calling that we have been called to. And Father, help us to be faithful even to the end for your glory. And Father, whether therefore we eat or drink or whatever we do, may we reflect the Shekinah glory of you back to you as we are lights to this world, a city that's set on a hill that cannot be hid. So let our light so shine before men that they might see our good works and glorify our Father, which is in heaven. So Father, help us to do that today. In your name we pray. Amen.